Hey guys, um, so this is part two of my series of videos on uh, pseudocode and topic four and pseudocode for the IB computer science exam. Um, this is probably gonna be the last part. I was gonna make three parts um, with another video um, of me just solving coding questions. But honestly, like that's just super tedious and it would take a ton of time. So I'm just gonna focus on mod and div uh, validation and then methods in this particular video, all involving pseudocode. Uh, my hope is that once I've covered these, you can take what I've taught you and then um, and then solve the problems on your own that are included in the slideshow. So let's get started. Uh, the first one we're going to learn about is the mod um, operator, which stands for modulo. Like mod and div in general are favorites of the IB for reasons that I don't really understand. Um, so you really need to understand how both of these work. Um, we'll start with the mod operator. Now the mod operator is used to figure out the remainder when two integers are divided by each other. So let's say we have 25 mod uh, 6, OK? Now, if we do old-fashioned division, like from the sixth grade or the third grade, really, we would get, uh, we'd probably get like 4 remainder 1, right? Because 4 times 6 is 24, and then we have 1 left over. I'm talking about doing long division. So in this case, 25 mod 6 is going to be equal to 1, because when we divide this number by this number, what's left over is going to be the mod. So let's take a look at a, another example. Let's say we do uh, 36, uh, 36 divided by 8, or 37 mod 8, rather. Okay. If we do 36 divided by 8, then we are going to get 4, remainder 4. So 4 times 8 is 32, and then we have 4 left over. So that means that 36 mod 8 is just going to be equal to 4. Now, I would say that the most common usage of this in the IB exam is to test for divisibility. So for example, if we want to check if a number is divisible by 3, we can do input to s, just get s from the user. okay? And we can say if uh, s mod 3 equals 0, then output ah. Then we can do output is divisible by 3. So let's just kind of see how this works. Let's say the user puts in s, and let's say they put in uh, 27. If we were to do, if we were to do 27, uh, 27 divided by 3, the old-fashioned way, we would get 9. Uh, sorry, yeah, we would get 9 mod 0, or remainder 0, right? Because 27 evenly divides into 3. So that means that 27 mod 3 would be equal to 0, hence the equality to 0 right here. On the other hand, if the user, type, if the user typed in 28, then we would get 9 remainder 1, and that means that 28 mod 3 would be equal to 1. Now, what that means is that this statement is not going to be true. This Boolean statement is not going to be true. And we're not going to print this out right here. We could actually just print out, instead, we could have an else statement. And we could just say, output uh, not divisible by 3. Uh, by three. And just do end of. So that's, that's an example of the most common use case for mod. Now, um, mod is also, I would say, like even more than divisibility. Mod and div are used heavily in trace tables. So you're very likely to get a trace table problem where you have a series of mod and divs and if statements, and you need to figure out what the output is. That being said, let's move on to div. Let's get rid of this, move on to div. Now, div operator can be viewed in two ways. Uh, it's You can view it as rounding up the result when two numbers are divided by each other, and finding out how many times one number fits into another. So basically, previously, when we did 28 mod 3, We had 9, remainder 1. OK? So 28 mod 3 equaled, sorry, this doesn't equal 9 remainder 1. This equals 1 because of the fact that 28 just divided by 3 equals 9 remainder 1. Now, if we do 28 div 3, which is different from this slash right here, that means that we're just going to get 9. So we're just discounting the remainder, and we're just getting 
the maximum number of times that this number fits into this number. Similarly, let's go to our previous example. We had 36 uh, mod 8. If we do 36 divided by 8, then we are going to get 4 remainder 4. So that means that 36 mod 8 is going to be equal to 4. Now, if we did 36 mod or div 8, we're just going to get 4 because this is 4 right here. Because 8 goes into 36 4 times and no more. One last example. Let's say we have... Uh, Let's say we have 17 mod uh, 3. Uh, that's going to be equal to 2 because 17 divided by 3 is going to be equal to 15 remainder 2. So that means that 17 div 3 will be equal to 15. All right, that's basically how div works. Um, I don't think there's anything more to say about that. I think one thing that I do still want to say about mod is that uh, if you have, so generally in, with mod, you're going to have the first value being greater than the, than the second value, just because of the fact that you're generally trying to figure out whether, how, whether this value um, divides into this value and then what the result is, what the remainder is. Um, it's just it's generally, generally a, a relationship between quotients, right? Um, or between, sorry, not between quotients, but it's, it's basically like the idea is that you're taking one number um, seeing and then seeing what's left over when you put it into another number. It's just the way that the questions are posed, really. However, if you do have something like this, so if you do have something like 3 mod 28, then if you think about division, like 3 divided by 28, if you think about long division, right, is this going to be... 0 remainder 3. 3 does not go into 28 any number of times. So that means that in this case, your um, answer is just going to be 3. Okay. So in the very specific case in which uh, you do have a smaller number, mod, you do have a smaller number, uh, mod, and then a larger number, you're just going to get whatever that smaller number was on the left side. Anyways, now we've covered the basics of mod and div. Let's go over and solve an IB style mod and div question. So write a program that takes an input of up to 99 cents. Based on the amount of cents entered by the user, calculate the minimum number of coins of the given types necessary to represent the amount. You can use four types of coins, but remember, you must calculate the fewest number of coins possible. So, if, so this is actually based on the American system. So if quarters, which are 25 cents, dimes, which are 10 cents, nickels, which are 5 cents, and pennies, which are 1 cent. So for example, if the user enters 97 cents, your output should be 3 quarters, 2 dimes, and 2 pennies, as this is the minimum number of coins with types required to represent 97 cents. So how are we going to write this in pseudocode? Is we're going to get some input from the user. So we'll just get input, and we'll say cents. Okay. Um, what we're going to do as some validation, and I'm going to go over this, well, this is what I was going to go over next, but I might as well do it now, is we'll say, um, we'll say while sense is uh, less, is greater than 99, which is invalid, then make them re-enter then make them re-enter it. So while sense is greater than 99, we're going to Output a message, we're going to say output, uh, enter a valid uh, number of cents. Okay. And we're going to say cents equals input. Or actually, we can just do input cents again, rather. So this is a form of validation. So basically, we enter cents. If, the, if that value is greater than 99, we're going to display a message, and we're going to prompt the user to enter in a number of cents again. And then we're going to go back up here and check the condition. If the number of cents is still greater than 99, then we're going to go back through this code. If it is, actually, we should do greater than or equal to, uh, greater than. If the, if the value is less than or equal to 99, then we can move on to the next block of code. Actually, we should do a loop while, just follow the pseudocode conventions, and loop. Honestly, sometimes even I, I accidentally drop the conventions because it's just so artificial. Like, no one actually uses like a, propri a proprietary pseudocode. Anyways, moving on. Um, what we're going to do here is we are, now that we've kind of gotten the sense stuff out of the way, 
we're going to say, um, we're going to take our number of cents and we'll say, well, we're going to say quarters equals, mm, okay, we're going to say quarters equals cents div um, 25. So what this means is that, let's say that someone, for example, enters in uh, 76, 76, right? We're going to do 76 div 25, which is going to give us 3. We're going to use 76 as our example, OK? Because 25 goes into 76 three times. But we still have some sense left over once we do that, right? So next, we're going to do um, court. We're going to do remain, remaining. We'll do remaining. Uh, equals sense mod 25. And if we do 76 mod 25, if we just divided 26 by 76 by 25, we would have three remainder one. So that means right here we're going to have one. We just have one cent left. Okay. Um, next, we're going to do, uh, I guess it's dimes, right? Dimes equals uh, cents div 10. Actually, we're going to do remaining div. Mm, yeah, we should do remaining div 10. So we're going to say uh, dimes equals remaining. Div 10. So right here we have one cent remaining, and we're going to see how many times 10 fits into one, which is just going to be zero. OK. Um, and then we could just say our new value remaining would just be dimes mod 10. Um, actually, you know, let's just let's switch our example around right here, because this actually ends really quick. We'd only have one extra penny, right? So let's say we have like, uh, let's say we have 36, okay? Now, if we have 36 cents, then we would do 36 div 25, which would give us one. Um, and we would have about nine left over, so remaining would be nine. Then we would have dimes equals nine div 10, which is just equal zero because 10 can't go into nine. And we would have remaining equals dimes uh, mod 10. So we'd have 9 mod 10, which is still 9, actually. OK. And then now we're going to approach uh, nickels. So we'll say nickels equals remaining uh, mod 5. And if we did, so right now we're at 9 for remaining. So 9 mod 5 is going to equal 4 uh, because if we did nine divided by five, we would get one remainder four. Now remaining is gonna be equal to uh, nickels mod, so actually we should just have, sorry, we'll just put four right there. So remaining equals nickels, sorry, this should be remaining div five, my bad. Uh, nickels mod five would then be equal to, so we're gonna basically gonna have, um, so nickels is going to be 4 by this point. So we're going to have 4 mod 5. So that's going to be 4. Well, I'll put that in the comments because that's not, that's not actually what we're going to have. And then finally, we're going to have cents equals remaining. Because right now we've got 4 cents remaining, right? We're going to do remaining uh, div uh, 1 because each cent, I mean, it's just 1 cent, right? And if we do that, then we're actually going to end up having, we're actually gonna end up having, see, so four div one, one fits into four, four times. So we're gonna end up with remaining. And then we're gonna end up with remaining, which actually, I guess we don't even really need this at this point. Um, but if we did, if we had remaining equals um, sense, 
uh, mod four, you would just have zero at this point, right? Um, so what we could actually do right here is we could do output quarters and then our quarters variable. Dimes, uh, nickels, and then cents. Now, I hope you guys understood that. Um, it can be kind of difficult to explain this example, particularly when, like, I don't know, I just get a lot of questions when I usually explain it. But that's kind of the most complicated uh, explanation of, or the most one of the most complicated problems you could solve using div and mod. Um, I would probably say that, as we saw in our previous example, the divisibility, or just being able to understand what div and mod does in a, in a block of code, is most probably like the max sum you're going to have to do. This is just to give you a better sense of understanding. Um, some things to point out as well are the div and mod operators. These are lowercase mod, lowercase div. Uh, we've kind of already gone over this. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is validation. So validation makes sure that user input fits certain parameters. So in this case, uh, and make sure that sense is greater than 99. Well, we should probably have sense is greater than 99 and sense is greater than negative one, right? Or uh, is less, so we should have sense is less than negative one. Because basically what this is saying right here is that if the um, sent, if this number that was entered is greater than 99, um, and it's, le or I guess we could say or actually rather than end. So if it's greater than 99 or it's less than, or it's less than negative one, then we're gonna have the user input the number again. So we're basically making sure that the user input, which we had right here, fits into certain parameters, which is that our input is going to be less than or equal to 99 and, or, or well, I guess, or greater than, or and greater than, uh, than negative one. So zero, between zero and 99, basically. So the or means that it's gonna fit both of those categories. So it should be uh, less than or equal to 99 and greater than negative one, so zero or, greater, zero or greater. Now that's an example of validation. Um, we're using a while loop. We're always gonna use a while loop to do this because that, that's the easiest way for us to um, basically trap someone inside a loop according to certain conditions like so. We can't do it the same way with a for loop. Um, and I mean, also like the other thing too, is that this is an infinite loop and we can't really create an infinite loop with a for loop. So this is the best way to validate your input if and when a question asks for it. Um, again, as I said before, it traps the user in the loop until they enter a valid value. Okay, so the last major topic we're going to cover is gonna be methods, also referred to as functions. Basically on the SL exam and the HL exam for that matter, you need to be able to write and call functions in pseudocode. The HL exam gets a bit more complicated with stuff like recursion. Now, typically methods are used to simplify an existing problem. And generally I would say that the methods you write aren't going to be terribly complex, but you do need to know how they work and the syntax in terms of pseudocode. So what we're gonna do is we're going to just look at how to create a basic function. And then we're going to look at an IV problem on slide 37 uh, to just really kind of get more in depth into how methods work in pseudocode. So, what we're going to do is we're going to create a function called circle area, circle underscore area that calculates our area given a parameter of radius. And basically how that's going to look in pseudocode is we're going to have the method name. So we're just going to have circle area. There's no def like in Python. Um, it's more similar to how methods would be defined in Java, which after all does inspire, does, does inspire pseudocode. Um, so we've got circle area, then we're gonna have our parameter radius. If we got other parameters, like let's say for example, we were finding the area of a cone, we would have like slant height or something like that. But in this case, we only have one parameter, so it's just gonna be radius. Now, now that we've done that, we're just gonna go ahead and calculate the radius or the, sorry, the area. So we're gonna have area equals 3.14 uh, times radius times radius. Now, we don't really have a squared operator in pseudocode. Probably if you use a caret like this, some people would understand, or sorry, your examiners would understand, not just people. But I haven't seen it so far, so I just prefer to do this for radius squared. 
Um, once we've calculated the area, pi r squared, I'm just going to return that area using a return statement. And then this is important. In order to end the function, we're going to do uh, end and then the name of the method. So it's just going to be circle area without a space. So the name of the, the name of the function is circle area, and we're going to have end, no space, the name of the function again. And that's the basic syntax for calling a, for creating a method in pseudocode. If we want to call this method, we might say uh, area equals circle area, and then a radius of I don't know like five, and then we would get our answer, which would be stored in area. So now that we have a basic idea of the syntax of methods in pseudocode. Let's go ahead and let's look at a coding example. Let's go to slide 37. So right here, we have the following method, calc BMI, accepts person's height, which is going to be H, and weight, which is going to be W, and returns their body mass index. So we have a function here. It's called calc BMI. Notice the end calc BMI here. Uh, our input is H for height in meters and weight, W for weight in kilograms and we're returning B, which is going to be their body mass index. So right here it says Baris weighs 104 kilograms and is two meters tall. His BMI can be calculated by calling method calc BMI as follows. So basically we're calling this function right here. They're giving us that. Um, our input is gonna be two meters and it's gonna be 104 kilograms right here. So H is gonna be two meters, W is gonna be 104, so x right here is going to be h squared, which is going to be 4 in this case. And then b is going to be equal to 104 divided by 4, uh, which should just give us 26. So state the value of variable Baris BMI. Um, basically, we calculated 26 that gets stored in Baris BMI, and our answer is 26. So that one, we just kind of had to trace the value, or we had to, tra yeah, we had to trace our return value from Baris BMI. We're given some parameters, and we need to figure out what the output is. OK, so right here we've got a very function-heavy question. So it says a person can belong to one of the four weight categories. Um, and these are basically the ranges that correspond to different weight categories. Now, B, so the actual question is use pseudocode to construct an algorithm which accepts a person's BMI and outputs the weight category the person belongs to. Now, this question is terribly unclear. Now, it doesn't say whether we should accept their BMI as input, so using the input keyword. Uh, or whether it should be in the form of a function. And if it is in the form of the function, should we return it or should we output it? So what we're gonna do, especially since this is already part of a, of a question that very heavily relies on functions, we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna write a function in order to fulfill these requirements, which is actually what we end up needing to do according to the solution anyways. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to create the name. I'm just going to create a function called category. And since our input is BMI, we're just going to have a variable called BMI. OK, so what we're going to say is if BMI is, I guess this is what BMI is less than 18.5. So BMI is less than 18.5, then uh, then we're going to output underweight. Else if, uh, let's say BMI is, okay, it's going to be greater than 18.5 or 18, it's going to include 18.5, be less than 25.0. So if BMI is greater than or equal to 18.5, and BMI is less than 25.0, then we're going to output, I think that was like something like normal, what isn't it? Normal weight. Um, we'll have another, actually we shouldn't put elif, the, the actual like the formal syntax is else if, so let's do that. Then we'll have else if, um, so we're going to have, we'll just kind of copy this because it's basically what we need to do again. So if BMI is greater than or equal to 25.0 uh, and BMI is less than 30, you're overweight, I guess. I don't know. I don't really trust BMI. Um, okay, so output overweight. 
And then we're going to do else if uh, BMI is greater than or equal to 30, you're obese. So else if BMI is greater than or equal to 30, then you are, I guess, obese. It doesn't say what happens if you have a lot of muscle, but anyways. So this is going to be our function, and then because it said output, we're just outputting it. So we're basically just printing out uh, the output right here. Um, if it was a function, we'd obviously have a return statement in each of these places. And then we're just going to do end category to close out the function. Um, now I guess this is like more of a subprogram, really, than even a method. Um, but that's actually just what the, uh, what the mark scheme tells us. Now, the interesting thing is that is even unclear to me is whether this actually needs to be in a function format or not, because like none, nothing here really says anything about a function definition, but all the, all the example answers indicated that you had to have a function with some sort of name. Now, given the mark scheme, I would argue that while this is the way that we did it in order to put it in a function, that also if we just did like, if we did that, and then we just said input BMI, that would also be acceptable. So I think that either one is actually acceptable given the mark scheme. Um, but I guess that was, a good, that was a great way for us to just be able to create a method in pseudocode. And also, I mean, that is what the example answer says. Again, the IB exam is not the most ambiguous, or it's not the most clear, sorry, it's definitely ambiguous. Now, moving on right here, it says the data about a group of adults and their height measurement in meters and weight is held in three one-dimensional arrays. Um, so we've got three arrays. We've got one called name, weight, and height. And importantly, like in most IB questions, these all match up to each other. So we have basically got um, we've got a name, a weight, and a height. And they all have the same indices. So like Baris has a weight of 100 kilograms and a height of 2 meters. And so name 1 matches up to weight 1, which matches up to height 1. Now to state the name of the person whose height is held in height three, therefore, by the logic that we just sort of went through, um, this is height three, so that person is gonna be Paul. Now moving on to the rest of this question. Um, so we identify one reason why a binary search algorithm cannot be used to find the name of the person whose height is given. Um, the reason for that is just because to use a binary search algorithm, everything has to be sorted either in ascending or descending order which none of these are. So we can't really use either height or weight in order to find, or I guess in this case, just height, but we can't use either one to find the name of a person based on their height, um, at least via a binary search algorithm. We could use a linear search algorithm, but not a binary search algorithm because height is not sorted. Uh, describe, how, describe how the name of a person whose height is given could be output. So the easy answer to that is we would just look through the height array right here for the height we're given. And then based on the index of that height, we could just go back and get their name. Now, this of course assumes that there are no duplicate heights, which we're not really told again, but I guess that's true based on the mark scheme. I mean, honestly, this is a bit ridiculous. Um, so that's basically what the mark scheme said. Okay, so this is the last question. Basically what we need to do is construct an algorithm which will output the names of all people whose BMI is greater than the group's average BMI. And we're going to use the method calc BMI to do that. So we're going to break this down into a couple of steps. So first, we need to get the group's uh, BMI. So the, the well, I get, yeah, the group's average BMI. Then we need to compare the average BMI to the individual BMI of each member. And then thirdly, but kind of concurrently, what we're going to be doing is outputting the names of those who have higher than the average. Then, And what we need to do is we need to use calc BMI, which basically has two parameters. And that has, let's just go back here and review. Basically, we've got calc BMI, which accepts a height, or rather, yeah, so it accepts a height and a weight. So we're going to have height and weight. And in order to do this as well, we're going to have access to three arrays. 
which are all in sequence. So we've got the name array, we've got the weight array, and we've got the height array. And all of these indices correspond to each other, as we talked about. So Annie, 52.4, 1.56, index 0. So we'll just make a list of those right here. We've got name, weight, and height. Okay. So we know what we have to do, we know what we have to do and we know what data structures we have to work with. So first, let's get the group's average BMI. Uh, I'm going to start by just adding them all up. I'm going to create a variable called sum and sub equal to zero. Then I'm going to loop from zero to name dot length minus one. So that's going to be so well. Each of these have twenty nine. Each of these have thirty elements. So we can just say name 30, just to be clear. And height 30. Now, this isn't part of our pseudocode. This is just me kind of putting this here. So I just understand what I'm working with. So we can do name.length minus one, which will take us from zero to 29, or probably just to be even clearer, we can just do, we can just do this. And now that we've done that, we're gonna do sum equals sum plus um, well, we want to add up the BMIs. So we're going to do calc BMI, uh, weight, or rather height, I, weight I. So we're basically going and getting the height and weight for each and every person. Sorry, this should be 29. Um, from the index 0 to 29. And, af and af right after we do that, we're calculating the BMI using those values and adding it to our current sum. So that way we'll get a sum of all BMIs for everyone from 0 to 29. We're going to do end loop, and then we're going to do average equals sum divided by 30, because that's the number of, of names or people that we have, and the number of elements we really have in each uh, array. So now that we have the average, we can compare the average BMI to the individual BMI of each member. So what we're going to do here is, again, we're going to do loop i from 0 to 29, because we're going to go through every single member get their individual BMI, and then compare it to our average in an if statement. So let's go ahead and just call this average BMI just to be a bit more clear. So now that we've got that, we're going to say if uh, calc BMI. So we're just going to copy this right here. Um, now this would work. We can use I for both of these. But let's just say to be a bit more clear, I'll just change the, um, the name of the counter to J. So we'll just say if calc. So this is for every single member. Um, if calc uh, BMI height J, weight J is greater than um, uh, average BMI, then we're going to output their name. So we'll just say uh, name J. Let's just make sure all of these are the same. So height, weight, and name. I just want to go back. OK, name, weight, height. I just want to make sure that the names of those arrays were correct. Um, also, I just want to go back to the question as well, um, just before we go on. So we are outputting the names of all people as BMI is greater than the group's average, not greater than or equal to. So we're going to say, OK, yeah, so I guess we did that right. Output name J. Uh, and if, and uh, end loop right there. And that's actually about it. So that brings us to the end of part two. As I said before, um, hopefully, so far, hopefully now after part one and part two, you have all the tools necessary to be able to uh, complete the SL exam or the programming portion of the SL exam. Um, again, like I, I was going to go through the practice problems, but I don't think that I'm going to just because honestly, I think it's pretty tedious for everyone involved. However, if you do want to see me work through those, go ahead and, uh, and put a comment below this video. Anyways, if you found value in this video and want to see more like it, please remember to like and subscribe. Have a nice day.